Hello, lovely internet strangers. It's been a while, I know, but I am back with the next installment in an anti-feminist reads the feminist canon series, using the term feminist canon very loosely. For those of you who are new, this is a series where I read books that are from the feminist canon, as well as a variety of books that relate to the topic of feminism, women's rights, women's place in the world, and gender relations. I'll also be reading what I would consider the anti-feminist canon, which is essentially a list of books I came up with because I couldn't find an anti-feminist canon list on the internet. Surprise, surprise. I hope you'll bear with me. I will be reading off of a script instead of my usual off-the-cuff style. I already tried to record this in an off-the-cuff style, but the audio came out so bad that I couldn't fix it. I essentially ran the video through um, a free transcription service and turned that transcript into a script. So if anyone needs that service, it is otter.ai. It was very helpful. The topic of today's video is Woman and the New Race by Margaret Sanger, which was published in 1920. Yes, that Margaret Sanger, the one you are thinking of that is associated with Land Parenthood. So first, why I chose this book. It was on a list of feminist books, and I've discovered in all of my studies that one of the most central subjects for feminists is motherhood, understandably so. And the advent of widely available birth control technologies really changed the game for women. So I thought it was important to read a book on the subject from the woman whose name is synonymous with the topic, Margaret Sanger. I'm sure at some point I'll read more about birth control in the 1960s, but I feel it's important to know the roots and trace the history of this technology and how it relates to women's movements. So where does this book sit in the feminist timeline? 1920 was the year that the 19th Amendment was ratified. It's somewhat unclear if this book was published before or after, but I would guess slightly before, assuming that most of the writings were done decently ahead of publication. Essentially, it was published at the pinnacle of the women's suffrage movement. This book proceeds Virginia Woolf's A Room of One's Own, which is one of the earliest books in the feminist canon by about a decade. The word feminism existed, but it was rarely used. It was more common to speak of specific causes like women's suffrage, or in Sanger's case, voluntary motherhood or free motherhood. Or if you watch my previous video on women in economics, when she talks about the economic independence for women. This book has a similar structure to Women in Economics by Charlotte Perkins Gilman. That is to say, Sanger lays out a clear central argument and then proceeds chapter by chapter to present points that support her arguments as well as address known criticisms. Unlike Gilman in Women in Economics, Sanger has plenty of data to support her arguments. However, the standards and practices in place today regarding citations didn't exist. Occasionally, she cites the source or gives the name of a study, but for the most part, you have to take the data on faith. But she needs to present this data because infant and child mortality rates are key supports to her central argument. Moving on to the relevant author biographical information, in addition to her work as a social reformer, sex educator, and writer, Sanger was a nurse by profession, and she was born in 1879, so she was 41 when this book was published. She popularized the term birth control and opened the first birth control clinic in the United States in 1916, and she established organizations that would later evolve into the Planned Parenthood Federation of America. In 1914, her pamphlet Family Limitation got her prosecuted under the Comstock Act, which was a piece of legislation that criminalized the sending of obscene material through the mail, and and this included literature on contraceptives. When she was prosecuted, she fled to Europe until she knew it was safe to return to the US, and she learned a lot there about family planning clinics, and she brought that knowledge back with her to the US. Her efforts contributed to several legal cases that helped make contraceptives legal in the United States. However, she died shortly before the release of the hormonal contraceptive pill in any kind of widespread manner. Uh, I believe she died a year after birth control was officially legalized in the United States, so she was not around to, to see the results. Now I will present her key argument as well as some supporting arguments. Here are some key quotes that express Sanger's key argument in her own words. Quote, Woman's desire for freedom is born of the feminine spirit, which is the absolute elemental inner urge of womanhood. It is the strongest force in her nature. It cannot be destroyed. It can merely be diverted from its natural expression into violent and destructive channels. She also says the, quote, chief obstacles to the normal expression of this force are undesired pregnancy and the burden of unwanted children. And these obstacles, quote, have always been and always will be swept aside by a considerable proportion of women. And, quote, the most important force in the remaking of the world is a free 
motherhood. So Sanger's main argument is that women need to be able to choose when they have children as well as how many children they have. She argues that a lack of control over motherhood is what prevents women from leading full lives as fully realized individuals and that something in women's inner nature recognizes this truth and therefore moves them to take control of motherhood by any means that are available to them, which has included in the past and continues to include both abortion and infanticide. And she is advocating birth control as an alternative. She also believes that women have the power and the duty to use control over motherhood to end the world's problems. Now, most people associate Sanger with abortion because they associate her with Planned Parenthood. However, she was vehemently opposed to abortion. She understood that women would turn to abortion if it were the only option, so she presented birth control as an alternative. Sanger wasn't opposed to abortion because killing the fetus was murder, but because she saw that abortion was physically and mentally harmful to women. Undertaking such a violent act corrupted something in the female spirit, according to Sanger. So Margaret Sanger would not have been on the hashtag shout your abortion train. I think she would be very, very distressed to see that movement. So now I'll share some of her main points. She believes that women's health is at stake. She talks extensively in the book about the effects of multiple pregnancies on women, especially pregnancies that happen one after the other. So she's advocating for the ability to space out pregnancies. And she also has strong opinions about what age women should be when they have children for the sake of their health, which is honestly quite old, historically speaking. She advocates for age 25. Now Sanger lived at a time when the most recent statistics available from 1913 showed that childbirth caused more deaths among women aged 15 to 44 than any other disease except tuberculosis. In addition to effects on women's health, a lack of control over motherhood led to more children than a family could care for properly. Because more children came into the household, but the household wage earnings didn't increase, with each additional child there was a lower quality of life because the level of poverty increased, but also because the children would then generally have to work in the factories, which would drive down wages for the adults in the family. Sanger is speaking about the lower classes here, the working classes. She does speak a little bit about the upper classes, but mostly she focused on bringing birth control to the poor and the uneducated because those are the ones that she felt needed the information the most because it specifically impacted them economically. One of the reasons it's so important to correct these poor living conditions, according to Sanger, is that she was a proponent of eugenics. Similar to Charlotte Perkins Gilman, she talks a lot about the race, that is the human race, the equality of the racial stock, that having women whose health is put in jeopardy by unwanted pregnancies and pregnancies in quick succession leads to a lower quality of health for children and leads to generations of weak people that will continue to produce feeble-minded children and children more prone to illness. Ah, the eugenicists love that word, feeble-minded, but I digress. Sanger felt that women had a responsibility toward the future of the human race, that they were the ones responsible for shaping it. So they needed to be able to control when they had children, how many children they had, and with whom they had those children. She believed that they could control the quality of their children both by whom they produce those children with, but also by ceasing to have more children if there was a problem with the first one, like feeble-mindedness, that essentially that was signaling something wrong with their racial stock, and they should not bring any more of such children into the world to be a burden on society. Sanger makes an additional argument about the effect of unwanted children on society in general, which is based on Malthusian thinking. If you're not aware of Thomas Malthus, he was an economist who wrote an essay in 1798 called An Essay on the Principle of Population. Essentially, he argued that humans would acquire abundance, but then they would use that to drive population growth, which would then lead to a decreased standard of living. That populations would grow until the lower classes were suffering from more hunger and disease. He basically saw that whenever conditions improved, population growth was inevitable, and that prevented real progress toward a utopian society. Malthusian thinking has largely been debunked, but it was very popular at that time, and there is still a modern strain of it, like the people who say we should stop having kids to save the environment. So, because of her Malthusian thinking, Sanger believed it was important for women to be able to control how many children they had, because the more children you have, the more the population grows, and the more the population grows, the more wars there will be, because there are more soldiers to fight the wars, and also because the more children there are, the greater the population is, and the more that the state can justify wars, because they need more terror territory to fit the population. So in her view, women would be able to stop wars by controlling the number of children they have. Sanger further believes that voluntary motherhood will allow the woman herself to flourish. She sees that women are not able to have full personhood when they are burdened by unwanted children. Sanger mentions the hetera, which translates to stranger women in Greek. Sanger describes them as women in ancient Greece whose homes were gathering places for philosophers, poets, sculptors, and statesmen, and that they were free from the burden of too many children, unlike the citizen wives who were bound to their homes. 
So the only way that women would be able to engage in intellectual activity would be to control motherhood. However, from my research, it appears that the hetero were actually courtesans. That is, very high quality and intelligent companionship for the elite men in society. There's some conflicting theories on that, but it's not as simple as just saying these were women that got to live independently and have an intellectual life. They were prostitutes. High quality prostitutes. Prostitutes with, yes, a lot of freedom, but still prostitutes. Anyway, she wants to prevent this emergence of womanhood into motherhood to keep women from becoming essentially like robot mothers or brood mares. She talks about how women will be a better quality of mother when every child they have is a child that they want and that children have the right to be born into an environment that is filled with love. That choosing motherhood will create a better environment between the woman and her mate and also that she will get to choose her mate. Sanger addresses the counter argument from her opponents that well if you don't want to have kids then you can just be celibate. But obviously that doesn't work for most people. It makes your marital life very unhappy. It especially makes your husband very unhappy. Happy. And she said that yes, women can decide not to have children, but those women are not the ones that are going to remake the world, as she put it. That women have this duty to shape the future of the world. She uses this very flowery language throughout the book. She says things like, quote, when motherhood is a high privilege, not a sordid slavish requirement, it will encircle all and its beating will shine upon all for its beauty is of the soul. She also said, quote, voluntary motherhood is motherhood in its high and holiest form. And quote, fearless motherhood goes out in love and passion for justice to all mankind. She believed that the freed mother, the voluntary mother, would have compassion for all children, for all of humanity, and not just her own children and her own family. So it's very spiritual talk. She was a classic progressive and she uses that language. She doesn't say social organism specifically, which is a key term for the classic progressives, but she really harps on this idea of the fitness of the race and the idea that women's freedom will end feeble-mindedness and oppression and physical deterioration that because women will not have low quality children, therefore we will improve the quality of the race and that this is an important task. And that's all classic progressive talk. So what do I think of her arguments? As I've said, I think the Malthusian thinking is incorrect. It was a popular way to think at the time, but I think she would be surprised to see the world's population today, certainly. Where I would agree with Sanger is that voluntary motherhood is central to women being able to lead a well-rounded life as fully realized individuals. I say this as someone who is always a masculine of center and personality and someone who is still undecided as to whether to have children, but not because I dislike children. There are definitely those women who don't want to become a mother because they hate kids and those people honestly freak me a little bit. But just because you love children and are nurturing, that doesn't mean your best path when you have options available to you is to take on the 24-7 role of mother for life. And so I do think that women being able to choose whether to become a mother, to choose when and with whom to do so, and to space out their pregnancies gives them the freedom to design their lives. That allows women to wait until they finish their education before having a child, to wait until they are transitioning from one job to another to have a child, they can plan. And I think the voluntary motherhood slash birth control gives freedom to women who in the past, if they rejected the role of mother, would have had to lead a life of celibacy or otherwise take great risks to have sexual relationships. Even Jordan Peterson has said that there are some women Women that should not be mothers. There are some women that do not have the instinct for it. I think that all women have a nurturing instinct within them, but I think that not all women are born with the kind of personality that is needed for motherhood. Again, I'm personally undecided on the question. I think that if I had to, I would be able to do it, but in a world where I have a choice, I'm not so sure. Now the kind of birth control that she's talking about specifically are diaphragms. That's what I found when I did some research into Sanger. She wasn't able to really talk specifically in the book because of the obscenity laws at the time, the Comstock Act that I mentioned before. So Sanger was talking about this concept of birth control before the advent of hormonal contraceptives. And I'm totally on board with birth control in that sense as she's describing it in terms of condoms, diaphragms, anything similar, and also the fertility awareness method, which is becoming more and more popular, which was first popularized, I believe, by the book Taking charge of your fertility and this technique is becoming more widespread and the science is continuing to evolve. So now for the buy, borrow, bypass portion, which is to say, is this a must read, a get to it if you can, or definitely don't read this. I would say this is a borrow, aka a get to it if you can. It's not part of the main feminist canon, but if you're not taking notes on it extensively like me, it's not that long of a read. And it's interesting to read about birth control at that time, right around the suffrage movement way before for the pill. And it's good to read about the idea from the pure perspective of the barrier method rather than getting caught up in arguments about how the pill works and effects on women's health. And she makes actual arguments in this book. It's not like most of these feminist books that come out now that largely have the woman's personal story in there and a lot of what I call feminist whining. Whether you agree with Sanger's position or not, I think it's a worthwhile read if you want to understand the arguments that she's making and for you to see that a lot of the underpinnings of current feminist thought was already 
present in this book in 1920. But at the same time, that there were ways in which Sanger, who was seen as a forerunner of the movement, was very different from the current feminist movement because she was very anti-abortion, although not necessarily for religious reasons. So that is my review of Woman in the New Race. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you learned something. I'm sure that probably none of you have read it, but now you don't have to because I just basically explained most of the book to you. So if you have any questions or if there are any of Sanger's ideas that you want me to talk about more, let me know. I took plenty of notes because someday I would like to write a longer book about all of this. But for now, this is where I leave you. If you enjoyed this video, please give it a like. If you'd like to see more, please subscribe, and I hope to have more content for you very soon.